Happy St. Patrick's Day, and welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics 2021 Spring Semester, The Modern American City, Past, Present, and Future. I am Patrick Tui with the Better Cities Project, a fellow at the Dole Institute. This is our fourth of seven sessions. Previously, we've discussed population changes, municipal finance, and cities' history with segregation. This week, we are talking about economic development incentives or subsidies. I wanna begin by being transparent. I am absolutely opposed to the vast majority of economic development incentives cities hand out. And I say vast majority only because there may be a good one or two out there that I haven't heard of. My guests today, to the best of my knowledge, share my view. So I'm gonna be extra careful to make sure we present such subsidies in the best light and that we take care to be responsible in our criticism. But I wanted to make it clear where I stand. Uh, let me remind the, the audience that throughout the presentation, you may email any questions you have to dolequestions at ku.edu, and we will endeavor in the last few minutes to answer as many as we can. My guests today are Michael Lefebvre and Haywood Sanders, both accomplished writers and researchers on economic development policy. Michael Lefebvre is the Senior Director of the Moray Fiscal Policy Initiative for the Mackinac Center for Public Policy. And I think it's fair to say, Mike, that you are also a critical a critic of economic development programs. Haywood Sanders is a professor of public administration at the University of Texas at San Antonio, as well as the author of Convention Center Follies, Politics, Power, and Public Investment in American Cities. Despite, or maybe because of its depth of research, coming in at just over 500 pages. This book ought to be required reading of every local elected official in the United States. Thank you both for being here today. I am grateful. Uh, Mike, I'll start with you. Help us sure. define our terms. What is an economic development subsidy or incentive? I, I use those terms interchangeably, by the way, and, and maybe there's a distinction that should be made. An economic development incentive is one provided by the government to lower the cost of doing business or producing revenue for a particular business or corporation or a class of them. So the government might offer a business or industry group a tax credit, a subsidy or tax abatement, perhaps at the local level, and um, not offer them to others. Sometimes the um, the handouts, as you might uh, consider economic development, will happen for an industry that might not cleanly fall into that description. I find in, in my home state that um, tourism promotion may fall outside of it. For instance, uh, taking taxpayer money to uh, hire a commercial firm to run advertisements backing tourists to come to Michigan. This too, in my view, would be, would, would be filed under economic development, but wouldn't necessarily cleanly fall into my definition. So can you can you kind of break apart the various different programs that are under that umbrella? Again, you mentioned abatements. Of course, there's tax increment financing, uh, enhanced enterprise zones. How are they different? Uh, is it fair to kind of lump them together? Uh, you talked about tourism. Tease them out for us. Sure. Well, based on my definition, I think they fall into a category uh, in very fairly. Uh, there's a lot of what I call today uh, new wine and old skin. Uh, you have a lot of economic development programs with different names, uh, but they all end up trying to provide a competitive advantage to one corporation or business versus another, or another one industry over another. Uh, a tax credit is um, simply a credit against what businesses might otherwise have to pay. Uh, the, many of those have become ref become refundable tax credits in the modern era of economic development programs. And um, the company might actually end up receiving a subsidy check if the tax credit or if their tax bill was um, lower than what the tax credit was worth. You uh, have outright subsidies, grants are very popular. Uh, and there's something like 2,000 of these programs at the state and local level nationwide. Tax credits being the most popular, followed by uh, grants and then loans and then exemptions. Um, they're different, but at the end of the day, very much the same. And what's, what's the history of them? When did municipalities or states start offering them? Uh, and, and are they different now than they were back then? 
The uh, modern economic war between the states and even localities has really been traced back by scholars to two cities in Mississippi during the Great Depression, both Columbia and Durant. Columbia had a mayor there who wanted to attract northern manufacturers into his town. He wanted to find jobs for people during the Great Depression. And so he hit upon the idea of going to the private sector and saying, will you offer us collateral to build a building that will help us lure a manufacturer into it to save them money. It'll provide them with an incentive to move here and provide jobs to our local and more jobs with them. And that actually uh, worked out. Private citizens did offer up money, but that mayor went on to become uh, the governor of Mississippi. And he wanted to bring that program, that idea into the front using uh, the mechanism of, of a public program. So he ended up creating really the first industrial revenue bond program for municipalities to use in his state. And uh, scholars have actually traced the first instance where a company moved across a state line from city to city as a result of an incentive program to Durant, Mississippi, which uh, offered to use these industrial revenue bonds to build a building for the sake of bringing a hosiery company from Indianapolis to Durant. And uh, the, the rest, as they say, is history. You know, the uh, industrial revenue bonds are today very ubiquitous, and it all started with Durant, Mississippi. Uh, of course, incentives go back much further, but not to the same degree we've been talking about since the Great Depression forward. In the last uh, quarter century, where I've been working in this field, I've seen the pendulum on economic development ideas at the federal, state, and local level swing back and forth, uh, not only for large incentives at the federal level, but smaller ones at the state and local ones. I've seen opposition to them in terms of a call for Congress in the 1990s to ban them in the states. I've seen states uh, call for compacts during the 1990s so they wouldn't have to engage in an internecine war over jobs using subsidies. Uh, that, by the way, has circled back. We're seeing that again today as a possible tool for limiting the use of economic development incentives at the state and local level. Uh, in response, I think, to a lot of criticism back in the 90s and the aughts, we saw technocratic responses to uh, economic development criticism, or criticism of these programs, where the technicians would say, you know, you're right, our programs do have these shortcomings, but we'll respond by adding uh, legal language, demanding that executives sign clauses that say, but for this incentive, we wouldn't have come here. Uh, clawbacks in uh, contracts mandating that companies pay back the incentives if they um, create jobs and then eliminate them or move out of state. And of course, we've also seen at the local level the use of referendums uh, in an attempt to uh, truly ascertain whether voters wanted a particular incentive deal or not, particularly popular when it came to um, stadium deals for stadium subsidies. You know, out in San Francisco, I think voters voted down public subsidies for a stadium four times before the owners decided to build a stadium with their own money. Uh, in other instances, we've seen uh, stadium owners work around referendums creatively. So there's a, there's a long and detailed history here, and it's one that we, it keeps going. But during the aughts, we saw the use of incentives expand, though towards the end of the Great Recession, um, several states, including my own, tried to rein them back in. Have those efforts you talked about clawbacks or having executives sign affidavits for the, you know, the need for them, have any of those worked at either improving, uh, or I should say reducing the risk for voters, for taxpayers, or improving the quality of deals? And I ask because in Missouri, where I'm most familiar, uh, they're paper tigers. Uh, the, they, they, they institute all these uh, terms and standards but the terms and standards have no meaning. And so it just becomes a, a, a facade. Well, I'm glad you ask. Uh, in terms of clawbacks, <clears throat> when they were being initiated to a greater degree, I saw units of government and the consultants they relied on at major accounting firms become uh, far more sensitive to the fact that these may need to be paid back. But since that time, what I've seen and what scholars like Nathan Jensen have found is that if a company is running up to a problem where they may have to lose their incentives or even offer money back because of poor performance, they will quickly rush to the grantor and say, would you please amend our deal? 
And that has happened a lot in Texas. We've seen it. In, and we've actually seen um, meeting minutes from officials at the state level in Michigan say, well, yeah, we could claw back this money, but you know, what's this small loss among friends type of response? So I think they um, started out well, but as usual, the system found a ways to get around uh, having to really live up to clawbacks and other mandates in the contracts. I want to talk in a minute about kind of what that scholarly research says about the utility of these deals. But it, uh, something you said earlier um, reminded me that during the Amazon deal, uh, Richard Florida, who is uh, described as an urbanist and, and uh, uh, teaches at the University of Toronto and talks a lot about city growth, uh, said that the, uh, the, the municipalities, the cities that were vying for Amazon uh, knew that they were being taken for a ride. Uh, they knew this was a scam. Um, they knew that Amazon was going to act however Amazon was going to act anyway. But they felt compelled to participate in the bid because if they didn't, someone else would get it. And I wonder, in your experience, how prevalent is that where nobody in a city, for example, might justify or argue in favor of these incentives, but they feel compelled because if they don't, the guys next door will? Well, we're talking about incentives here today, and there are political incentives and, and management incentives that matter <laughs> Public officials, whether they're appointed or elected, are under enormous pressure to, often to at least consider offering incentives. And since 95% of local units of government have some type of incentive to offer, they feel compelled either by public relations circumstance or sometimes state law to do so. So, you know, in some states you'll have a state level program, but as part of the law, it mandates that local incentive that local incentives be offered to ensure that local units have some sort of skin in the game. What I did see with Amazon was large and small cities both recognizing that they probably wouldn't win, but they should participate in some way as well. So you have um, a situation in Toronto where they ultimately offered zero dollars of incentives to Amazon. I thought that was fairly responsible because they looked at this and said, this could be too expensive. We don't want to compete with those states who are probably offering billions and billions of dollars worth. Um, and then you have small cities that took advantage of a public relations opportunity and figured, we're probably not going to win this. So let's just issue a public response saying, it's not, it's not you, Amazon, but we don't think that uh, we'd be a good fit for you. And then end up getting uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of earned media in the process. So uh, I do want to talk about that scholarly research because I've read it. I know you've read a lot more of it and, and conducted some of it. But one of the things as a, as a small government conservative myself, one of the things that occurred to me is lots of cities that would never admit that high taxes and regulation stymie development, business creation, and job growth are in fact conceding that point when they offer incentives. What they're basically saying is it's too expensive to develop here. It's too much of a regulatory morass to create jobs. So if we offer money, in effect, if we lower our taxes to just one or two firms, we can, uh, we can spur growth. Isn't that a win? Uh, for conservatives that that basically it, it concedes the argument that your taxes are too high? Well, it would be a win if it was publicly recognized as necessary to cut taxes in order to spur growth, but it's not. Too often, it's just a matter of this mercantilist game where one city has to say, well, look, we need to do this because if we don't, Akron will and they'll take our jobs. It becomes a public relations battle for jobs more so than evidence of sound policy. But this is also a great segue for us to talk about the scholarship because you'll find study after study after study where the scholars with no dog in a particular municipality or state's fights uh, have concluded that it's the highest tax areas that abate the most and low tax areas don't find the need to do so as much and so they abate less. And if you want to go back far enough, you can find the studies that take it a step further and say, well, OK, we have found evidence that our municipalities with the highest tax burdens are abating the most and our lower 
air, uh, taxed areas are abating the least, who is doing better economically by these particular measures? And they find that the low tax rare abate cities are doing better economically. Again, you have to go back a while. It's a, it's a theme in the literature though. You'll read it in summations of literature uh, that high tax, high regulatory areas seem to need to abate more, not only to try and attract new businesses to them, but to try to prevent old ones from leaving. Well, you're certainly aware of what we call in Kansas City, the border war, where not just municipalities fight with each other, uh, but Kansas and Missouri, uh, Kansas City, of course, is divided right down the middle by the, the state border. Kansas and Missouri uh, have been waging uh, for decades uh, uh, an economic development war of luring employers back and forth across state line. They've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this. And, and I don't know that regionally we've created any jobs, but Applebee's has moved back and forth across state lines several times. Uh, AMC theaters moved back and forth before being bought by the Chinese. Um, uh, uh, Waddell and Reed is a uh, financial services firm that, that just uh, got a deal again before being bought by an Australian firm. Uh, how prevalent, how prevalent is it around the country, not just in Kansas City, that maybe these corporate uh, government affairs departments have figured out that a significant portion of our bottom line can be simply shopping around for incentives? Oh, it's it's a there's a perfect knowledge of shopping around. In fact, I would argue that many of these corporations will first look to where they want to be and then go shopping for economic icing on their location cake. Because someday the incentives will probably run out and they're going to have to live with where they've chosen to move. And examples of this have been cataloged not just by me, but by institutions in North Carolina and, of course, our friends at Good Jobs First in Washington, D.C., which is a, a progressive economic institute that tracks uh, the use of subsidies around the country. Believe it or not, about 15 years ago, a PowerPoint presentation was somehow uh, intercepted, and it was produced by a major accounting firm that offers consultancy services to companies who want to get incentives in states. And the name of at least one section, perhaps the entire presentation, was called Milking the Cow of uh, State Government uh, Offices. Basically, it was a lesson in how to go to, how to use your government relations office to go to uh, various governments and milk that cow for incentives. And I've posted it on the Mackinac Center's website years ago. It's still available for people if they'd like to review it, but it might make them uh, more cynical than they already are should they do so. Um, another company, a major corporation that uh, Good Jobs first pointed out, actually listed in their required financial documents to the federal government for investors that if the incentive train that they were on should stop, their profits would be harmed. That was a warning they gave to investors. Uh, you, you remind me quickly that a, a, a hotel chain had asked for economic development incentives to build a hotel in downtown Kansas City. And the uh, the corporation, the, the nonprofit that, that handled the subsidies um, came back to them with an offer, but it wasn't the offer that they had wanted. It wasn't as much. And so they declined. And their attorney wrote a letter uh, to the to the nonprofit offering the incentives and basically said, there are too many hotels in downtown Kansas City, which means that our particular hotel risks losing money. So we want subsidies to build that hotel. In effect, what's happening is the economic development incentives are causing a glut of one type of development in downtown because there doesn't seem to be a long-term plan. And, and so my question to you is, again, I've observed this in Kansas City, but are incentives offered as a result of a city's long-term plan? Here's where we want to be in five years, 10 years, 15 years. Because it seems to me, uh, from my experience, what happens is a developer just shows up and says, hey, we want to do this give us some subsidies and the city reacts, gosh, we'd love to have that. And, uh, and then we're off to the show, but there's no long-term plan. Yeah, uh, it's a combination of both. I've been following economic development incentives for so long that I've seen cities with their own economic development plans that did not involve handing out favors to particular corporations, but rather sort of setting a table and saying, we're gonna provide you with 
this infrastructure and this brand new train to serve the downtown area. And then that was their economic development strategy and companies hopefully would find that um, uh, attractive as part of the overall uh, table that was set by a municipality. Uh, times have changed a great deal. You know, the, uh, the city I was thinking of was Detroit in the 60s. Uh, it was, they called themselves the city on the move. But, you know, just five, eight years ago, I think a program was created at the behest of a developer at the state level that allowed um, the state and local incentives for a project he wanted to build. And part of the explanation for the need for subsidies was, well, we wouldn't be able to build the vision that we have if it wasn't subsidized because there's just not a market for it. Well, if there's just not a market for it, then you have one strike against the, the you know, the rationale behind the, the project itself. Uh, I, I want to address uh, one other thing, and then I want to get uh, Haywood into this because of his book. But um, uh, it, it occurs to me that one of the problems in communicating to people that the fact that incentives really don't work, that at the end of a period of time, you rarely have created more jobs than you would have otherwise, is that when something is built, they can see it. They can point to a high rise office building uh, downtown that wasn't there before. Uh, they can point to a, an office complex or a shopping center and say, listen, it wasn't there three years ago. The city offered incentives. It's there now. How much of a fool are you, Patrick, for not being able to see that subsidies created this? Have you found a way of explaining to people that um, you didn't create any new commerce, you just moved it around, or you didn't create any new jobs, you just moved them onto one city block? And, and, and maybe people don't care. They just want to see the signs of a dynamic economy. Right. Uh, Two-part response, if I may. Uh, first of all, there's an asset side of a balance sheet and there's a liability side. I, when people point to that building, will say, but how many just jobs and buildings were destroyed in order to create that? That doesn't carry the day as well as a, a big building in a ribbon cutting ceremony. What I have found and what uh, scholar Nathan Jensen has backed up with uh, his own empirical research and survey work is the idea of opportunity cost. So you can say, well, Sure, this building was built and it cost this much, but how many potholes could be filled with that money? What Would the bridge be built? Would there not have been that latest tax hike? Um, would police have been better funded? Uh, the, John Mozina at the Center for Economic Accountability is doing a great job of describing the opportunity cost associated with these economic development programs. He's putting it in terms of how many uh, fire personnel you know, had to lose their job or who weren't hired what is spent on public health or the police. Uh, and that, re that message, by the way, resonates with voters. The survey research I was talking about, Nathan Jensen doing, looked at independent voters. And when you gave them a price tag on an economic development deal, they were deaf to it. $4 billion didn't ring with them, didn't resonate with them. But when you put it in terms of what could not be bought going forward in terms of other public services, it resonated with them very much. In fact, they would even change their position based on the description of the opportunity cost. One of the, uh, to that point, uh, communicating to people in Kansas City, at least, when we have uh, successful corporations such as Burns and McDonnell, uh, such as J.E. Dunn, uh, Cerner, for example, may be the single largest uh, recipient of subsidies in the United States, according to Good Jobs First. When you explain to them that these wealthy companies built their global headquarters at the cost of uh, public school children, 90% um, a visual, but I don't know that that every economic development subsidy around the country has the the benefit of that uh, 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 of that comparison. Sometimes, like you say, you're you're just trying to explain to people you spent money on this and it didn't go to something else. It it can be very frustrating. And then, of course, Indeed. you've got people who have no interest in understanding this because uh, they're on the gravy train somewhere, right? They're a consultant or they're a, a city councilor or they're uh, a, a pundit, and, and they somewhere in the mix are benefiting from the deal. Self-interest is a powerful thing, and it sometimes works against rational economic policy. Uh, so, Haywood, uh, I want to bring you in. I, I'm fascinated with 
your work because you talk a lot about what we've just discussed, but you're very specific to convention centers and you've done an incredible amount of research just looking at the promises made over the years and then, God forbid, checking it against the reality that came 5, 10, 15 years later. And so uh, describe a little bit about uh, the, the, what a convention center subsidy looks like and and um, how long we've been at this convention center war in the, in the United States. Well, we've been, the, the cities have been building places for public assembly and meetings for a very long time. Uh, Kansas City built a municipal auditorium. Uh, St. Louis did likewise, uh, both of them in the 20s and 30s at a time when uh, building public buildings was seen as a very positive thing. They were often uh, memorials to uh, World War I soldiers and sailors. Uh, but the the really big boom in convention center building began in 1960 in Chicago uh, with the development of McCormick Place, the, the kind of the nation's first big, modern, massive convention venue. Uh, and when a host of other Midwestern and uh, Eastern cities saw what Chicago was doing, uh, a city that had long had great appeal for national political conventions and other kinds of convention and assembly events. When, when other cities saw what Chicago was doing, it was really quite often, and we can document it pretty well, that there's entirely too much uh, in the Convention Center Follies book about just that, uh, where there would be a, a memo from the mayor saying Chicago's Getting, getting ahead of us. Chicago's building a bigger, newer, grander convention venue. Uh, and we just have this thing dating back to 1925. Let's build a new one. Uh, and at that point, when a great many of the nation's older cities were trying under the federal urban renewal program to rebuild the area in and around their downtown cores, uh, to reshape their central business districts. Uh, a new convention venue seemed to be the thing to do. It would, it would bring tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, of, of money, new money from out of town visitors that uh, would kind of sweep over the city and create jobs and economic opportunity. So, um... I understand that a city would want to invest in, you know, public safety and, and highways and green space and all that type of stuff. But why would a city want to invest in a convention center? Why wouldn't they just say, if we're a good market, then, you know, the Marriott's and the Lowe's and the Hilton's will come in, recognize our, um, uh, you know, our, our, the opportunity here and uh, and build it themselves it, it seems to me uh, and maybe i'm being naive it seems to me a contradiction that a city would say we've got a great opportunity here to attract conventioneers and also taxpayers need to pay for it well that that is precisely the peculiar disjuncture of the convention business um the the, the folks in the industry uh, who like to, to see these buildings built and expanded and renewed uh, year after year and decade after decade, uh, constantly argue the, the two magic words of economic impact. And so they say, well, the convention center loses money, as indeed it does. The uh, effectively almost every convention center, publicly owned convention center in the country uh, operates at a loss, not counting its construction and building costs. Uh, oh, but the argument is, well, all of these folks will come and we will get all of this new out of town spending, this economic impact. Uh, hotels capture some of that, but, uh, but by no means all. And it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing uh, with the possible exception of Las Vegas to, to capture all of that spending uh, for an individual hotel. 
So the answer has been consistently, we let the public do it. Uh, we let the public sector accept the loss uh, with the argument that there is somewhere a great economic benefit. Uh, and in turn, the hotels and the restaurants and the taxi cab owners, or perhaps the Uber and Lyft drivers these days will make the benefit of that. Uh, which sounds very appealing and has been in recent decades tied to the fact, uh, not unlike the subsidies that Michael was talking about, tied to the fact that most of these convention venues are financed with revenues that are tied to visitors, with taxes on hotels, taxes on rental cars, taxes on restaurant meals. And so the local citizenry is invariably told, well, you're not paying for this. This is a free good. You just see all, the, all that wonderful economic impact benefit. I, uh, I'm reminded one of my most uh, uh, frustrating aspects of dealing with this is exactly what you said, the economic impact statement. And uh, just for the benefit of our audience, uh, when you read an economic impact statement, what they might do is say, well, we're going to get this many people in our city for this many days, which equals out to this many hotel nights. And maybe we assume that hotel occupancy will be at 85 or 90% for that weekend. And here's what people will spend. And they add all that up and say, here's the uh, economic impact, what people will spend in hotels and restaurants. But the problem is, Without a convention that weekend, your hotel uh, occupancy might be around 66, 70 percent and restaurants will still be open. But they don't they don't count the difference between having a no convention and a convention. They simply say, here's what the economic impact will be compared to zero. And they pretend if you didn't have a convention that weekend, that uh, the whole downtown would be shuttered. And it, it, it's yeah. a pervasive I don't want to call it a mistake because I, I think they know better, but it's an accepted practice in economic development in economic impact statements to just say, well, if we didn't have this convention, there would be tumbleweeds rolling through downtown. And, and to make that point, when I explain it to people, when we had the, uh, you know, the, the, the parade downtown in Kansas City after the Royals won the World Series, I was able to find lots of people who canceled dentist appointments, who canceled trips downtown because they didn't want to deal with the crowds. And the problem is your economic impact statement never accounts the negatives. It just says it's all pure money. And so if, if any of you as students or, or citizens read an economic impact statement, just remember that they're comparing it to zero, not what the, the weekend might look like realistically. Um, hey, yeah. would tell me about the different players in, uh, in these conventions. We certainly have the, the politicians. We've got the voters who want something done. We've got the politicians who desperately want to demonstrate that something happened on their watch. But your book, uh, your book's uh, uh, additional entertainment value was that you tracked some of these developers who um, go around the country analyzing markets and saying, if you if you build this, this will happen. Can you can you talk about that and, and what the track record of these uh, consultants is? Sure. Um, there there are lots of folks who stand to benefit, but the folks who have the folks who have made this a marvelous industry uh, is the very small coterie of convention center consultants, uh, who, as you said, Patrick, that will literally go around the city from go around the country from city to city, and they'll produce a glossy, illustrated, uh, chart and graphic filled report uh, that compares your community to uh, a half dozen or a dozen others, uh, delivers some uh, grand assessment of your competitive position, uh, and then tell you that you need a, a newer, larger, expanded convention venue uh, and invariably, they will tell you exactly how many people will turn up and how many overnight hotel stays those folks will generate and how much economic development. And you're absolutely correct. Uh, all, all gross, never net. <laughs> how much economic development they'll generate. 
so if I might, a little story. Uh, when I first started looking seriously at the consultant business, uh, I was asked by a conservative think tank in Boston, the Pioneer Institute, to look at a consultant analysis uh, done in 1997 for a proposed new convention center in Boston. And that particular consultant, one Charlie Johnson by name, uh, produced a very thick, glossy report uh, that estimated uh, that there would be some 350, 400,000 annual new convention attendees in Boston, and they would produce a grand total each and every year of 789,000 hotel room nights, uh, which is a useful metric of the number of folks at a convention venue who come from out of town, who bring new money into the community, uh, as opposed to the, the local who didn't go to the, to the dentist, for example, in your, uh, in your analogy. Uh, and uh, I said, looking at the performance of other convention centers around the country, this doesn't make any sense. This is an implausible forecast. I guessed something on the order of 340, 350,000 annual room nights might turn up at that new Boston venue. Uh, well, the, 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 the Boston Globe uh, ran a lovely story saying that's absurd. We're, we're a great city. People love to visit Boston. We're going to do great. Uh, we'll have billions in economic impact. Uh, the state legislature went ahead and authorized the construction of this new venue. It opened, uh, and it's been open for, oh, a good 15 odd years now. Uh, I did a little open records request to them last year and asked how they did in 2019, and the answer was 389,000 room nights. So, uh, we get less than half of what Charlie said uh, Boston would get, which is in fact pretty much precisely the norm <laughs> around the country. Uh, the consultant gives you a forecast, uh, slice it in half if you're lucky, uh, by two thirds if you're not, uh, maybe a little worse in some places that aren't Boston. Are there, so are there any model cities uh you know las vegas i'm sure does very well regardless uh, i, I want to talk a little bit about about covid but but not just yet are there are there cities that either have been smarter about developing their tourism or paying for convention hell, uh, hotels or are there um ways they've gone about it that have actually um driven up uh attendance consistently or is this a bad deal for everyone well, the, the one thing I learned in this business, uh, when you look at it systematically, is it rarely turns out to be what folks think. Uh, so lots of folks think Las Vegas must be a great, successful convention uh, destination. Uh, and without speaking to its relative merits as a, as a visitor locale or a community, uh, the publicly owned Las Vegas Convention Center gives us a neat test, much as, uh, as Michael might describe. Uh, in the early 2000s, they doubled their size. They went from about 1 million uh, square feet of exhibit hall space uh, to 2 million. Uh, and so did their convention attendance double? And the answer is no. Um, did their convention attendance go up? Well, for a few years after they expanded, it did. And before the 2008 recession, they got to a peak of about 1.7 million convention attendees. That's in one year. And in 2019, pre-COVID, they had a grand total of 1.2 million convention attendees, which put them pretty much back to where they were before they doubled their size. Well, one of the things you talk about in your book, and I just want to see if this is still true, and again, leading up to you know the beginning of 2020, we won't count COVID against anyone just yet. 
uh, you, you argued that the convention industry in general was declining year over year, yet cities were more um, competitive in trying to draw that. So you, ha you had more people uh, spending more money fighting for what was a shrinking pie. Has that continued to be the case since you uh, published your book? Oh, absolutely. It's gotten worse. Um, I, I went back uh, in the middle of last year trying to make some sense out of what the global pandemic might do to convention business uh, and looked as systematically as I could at most of the major centers in North America. Uh, and pretty, pretty soon something became clear with an occasional exception. And, and I, one of those occasional exceptions is, is Orlando. Uh, with an occasional exception, most convention centers were, as of 2018 and 2019, doing less convention business in terms of attendance than they had done in 2006 and 2007, that they had still not gotten back to where they were before the Great Recession. Uh, what had happened, however, is lots more centers had expanded. And so there has been a price war such that pretty much every major convention venue in the country gives away its space rent free. Uh, and some of the investigative reporter staff at the Orlando Sentinel newspaper managed to get some contracts from the, the center there. Uh, so for example, uh, McDonald's was supposed to hold its annual worldwide franchisee conference at the Orlando Convention Center in 2020. Uh, they signed a contract in 2019 for the space at the convention center. Uh, at, at the bottom of the last page of the contract, it says total rent 1.65 million. And then there are a bunch of discounts and incentives listed. And finally, it says total rent zero. So that's the world we live in now before COVID. Convention centers in places like Atlanta and Orlando and Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Seattle and pretty much every place in between have been giving their space away for free. It's a great uh, business Mike, model. Michael, I wanna bring you in on this and then and then Haywood, I'll ask you the same question. Uh, Haywood uh, touched on an interesting point when he talked about the convention promises in Boston. And of course the Boston Globe uh, uh, said, you know, we're a great place. People are going to flock here. We ought to build it. Part of the frustration that that I've taken on is uh, cities take it personally. When you say uh, this is a bad deal, uh, they say, well, why don't you want to have uh, development in town? Or when you uh, question the wisdom, uh, they'll say, well, you just don't like this city. Uh, are Are there things that cities should and could be doing to draw a development rather than, or other than um, kind of just subsidizing it? Uh, is, there, is there a right way to grow and compete? Well, the scholarship that I've looked at is starting to, uh, has been talking for several years, but more so now than in the past about quality of place. I think I may have used the term, you know, setting the table or uh, sticking to the knitting. Uh, if local units actually concentrated more on uh, the fundamentals plus the things that seem to matter to footloose, footloose firms today, like uh, workforce and workforce development, they might be able to naturally draw those footloose companies to them rather than dangling a tax abatement or a credit. Uh, if a fair field and no favors may in the long run create far more jobs than these incentive programs uh, have done and in even more than the uh, politicians and others who support them uh, suggest that they do. So have any cities uh, acted that way? Have any cities uh, turned away from uh, kind of the quick and easy subsidy to look at a long-term solution such as workforce development? 
I'd mentioned earlier that the pendulum has been swinging back and forth. So I'll see states or, or, or regions, cities uh, doing the right right thing in a big way sometimes, and then I'll see it swing back and they'll use the incentive they felt uh, they were compelled to, or they really wanted to plant a particular high profile company. Uh, lately, I think that Austin has been very stingy with its incentives. Uh, that might be a function of the not in my backyard mentality. You know, Tesla didn't even try to get incentives when they talked about locating in Austin. But, um, you know, the folks in Austin are going to be tested because Samsung is looking for a big deal right now. And, you know, will they stay pure or will they offer up a big incentive? Uh, another thing they're doing is transparency. I think Memphis is uh, about to or has begun an experiment in dropping its major incentive program there. There was discussion of a six month hiatus on its subsidy, major subsidy program. That would be a big deal if they went that way. You know, in Austin, you have a fairly wealthy city with the not in my backyard attitude, whereas Memphis is poorer and wants more economic development. So if they drop their incentives, it'd be uh, an impressive and um, an impressive, not only impressive, but it would actually show some leadership in trying to do different. Uh, hey, would uh, uh, a similar question to you. Are there any cities that have... Um... Uh, develop their convention or tourism uh, industry in a, uh, a a good way, or at least a, a better way than just uh, subsidies and, and expanding convention facilities? Among major cities, it's very difficult to find an example of that, Patrick. Um, you know, we, we, we touched on the Austin case, and Austin's been uh, historically not uh, not a great community for subsidies in general. Uh, but they've been talking about expanding their convention center. Uh, and uh, the council authorized moving ahead with that. They got a consultant study uh, from one of the standard set of national consultants, HVS, uh, last August that said, pandemic notwithstanding, what Austin needs is a $1.2 billion convention center expansion. Uh, and, and Austin will reap the benefits of increased convention business. Uh, so, you know, what happens all too often is we see some temporary pauses. Uh, there is one right now in Massachusetts, in part because of Republican Governor Charlie Baker, uh, who paused an expansion of Austin's, it never delivered on the numbers <laughs> it promised, convention center. Uh, but there are relatively few that have chosen to not play this game. It's, uh, it's one where there are entirely too many interests. Uh, and in many ways, the, uh, the, the political table, as, as Michael might say, is entirely too loaded. Uh, it's something I think you saw directly in Kansas City with uh, their subsidies for what is now a, uh, a a relatively newly opened Lowe's hotel uh, that faces doing essentially no business in the next few years. Uh, so I was going to ask a little bit about COVID, but I think we, we probably don't know uh, and won't know for a few years what the, the impact of development uh, is caused by the lockdown. But I want to ask you this. Hey, would you point it out that a lot of these um, in a lot of these deals everybody's on the same side of the table. It's something I've seen in, in Missouri. The, the local consultant, uh, it, well, first of all, the, the, the council, the city council desperately wants to do something. They want to show there's a new building, there's a new development here. We did that. So they maybe they will hire a consultant. The consultant has every interest to uh, become a cheerleader for this. The consultant may turn to the state economic development uh, department, which again, has incentive to uh, to promote these because they can go back to their governor or the legislature and say, we've got a hundred counties participating in these types of deals. And so everybody seems to be sitting on the, the same side of the table, including sometimes the voters and taxpayers who who desperately want to see something happen in their community. So, so that's all set up for this. If you were advising a, a city council in considering these deals, what are the questions they ought to be asking? Uh, Michael, I'll start with you, either about economic development deals broadly, what, what are the tells, what are the red flags they should be looking for? 
And then Haywood, maybe you've got some convention specific uh, things that they should be looking for. Well, I would start out by asking local officials to ask themselves, what is the opportunity cost here? What am I gonna have to give up in order to get this company or this convention center? What is the true net impact of doing what we're considering doing rather than just what the consultant is telling us. There is a professor who's looked at some of these deals and the consultant's role in it as well, and he described consultants on economic development deals as expert witnesses in a trial. If your testimony undermines the, uh, the case of the lawyer who hired you, the chance of you being hired back is uh, fairly, fairly slim. And consultants know this, so they tend to put on um, uh, you know, a, a happy face for whatever particular um, economic development deal happens to be popular with those in power at the time. It is my hope that officials at the state and local level will actually demand that all uh, be included in their analyses so that local officials, state officials can have a better idea of the true impact instead of just becoming uh, cheerleaders for projects that may not create jobs on that balance. In fact, the McCormick place is a great example. If you have time, I'd like to swing back to that and give you an example. Give you well, a uh, I was going to say, you remind me, I sat in on a, a meeting of our local uh, tax increment financing commission, and, and they were considering a project. And as part of the filing, the developer hired a consultant to assess the degree to which the space had been blighted. And, uh, mm -hmm he testified how it was the worst uh, um, vandalism he had ever seen in the spot for, for, you know, in his 30 years of doing it. Um, never mind the fact that the building was going to be raised, whether it was in pristine condition or whether it was vandalized, that, that bore uh, nothing on the quality of the, the, the subsidy, but he, he made all this point. And I, and I asked him when I had a question, how many years have you been doing this? And have you ever not found a, parcel to be blighted. And he was prepared for the question and said, well, oftentimes when I'm hired by a developer, I'll say, well, let me kind of do a drive by of the space first and, and give you my a quick reaction. And if I find that I think it's, it's not blighted, then I'll tell them that and, and maybe they'll want to go and talk to a, another consultant. And it occurred to me, what that means is when the developer hires him, they know exactly what they're going to get beforehand. And two, if he were a home inspector and admitted that, he'd be in jail. But uh, <laughs> economic development subsidies kind of, uh, mm. we operate with all these contradictions and all these oddities that, that nobody ever questions. Um, Heywood, let me ask you, if you were advising a council as they were considering subsidies for a convention center or hotel, what ought they look for? What questions would you want them to ask? Well, you want to deal in reality. So you want to ask the consultant, how have they forecast in the past and what's happened? Uh, you want to ask, where are the examples that cities have seen these grand benefits and rewards? Uh, how have your forecasts done? Uh, and you want, to, you want to make it a point of looking and talking about specific instances of performance. Um, over and over, I'll read consultant studies, and they'll talk about this city has a lovely arena, or this city has a wonderful convention venue, but they won't ever bother to mention how they actually perform. And so uh, real empirical evidence on performance is key. Uh, but the other, the other issue is one needs to have an understanding of, down, of downside risk. What's it going to cost in both real dollars and, and lost opportunities and opportunity costs? What's it going to cost if we do this and it doesn't work out the way that uh, the consultant forecasts, the way the backers hope? Uh, who's going to pay the price and what might that price look like? Uh, because all too often, uh, and that's precisely where we are right now in the midst of COVID. Uh, all too often, cities have built convention centers that they now find don't generate any revenue at all. Uh, 
they've gone into the hotel business in places like uh, San Antonio and Dallas and Baltimore and even Overland Park, Kansas, uh, only to find that owning a hotel in the midst of a global pandemic is not necessarily a particularly rewarding place to be. Uh, no, I imagine in the next few years, we will find out exactly how exposed cities were uh, because of the lockdown. Michael, there was an example you wanted to uh, to talk about. Why don't you go ahead and, and before you start, let me remind any viewers we have, uh, if they have questions, you can email us at dolequestions at ku.edu. And I see we've got one or two we can get to in a minute, but Michael, go ahead. Yeah, th this particular example involves the McCormick Place Convention Center, and it involves the hiring consultants to do economic impact analysis. Back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, uh, a major accounting firm was hired uh, to look at the economic impact of the McCormick Place should it expand. And they predicted 6,000 jobs that would result from the expansion of the McCormick Place. And um, the problem was once uh, uh, scholars got their hands on this analysis and found that the accounting firm left out costs associated with the expansion, such as the, the tax cost to it and how many jobs would be displaced as a result of the expansion. The estimates went from the accounting firm saying 6,000 new jobs to this scholar using a, a, a model very responsibly uh, saying that no, a net loss of 400 jobs would result. So, you know, a, a plea for responsibility in hiring consultants to look at these um, at these convention centers and other economic economic development opportunities, they have to include all the costs and perhaps even do a run at the opportunity associated with it. I think the state of Florida does that very well. They have a model that they'll run uh, the impact on, and then they'll run another analysis and say, well, if we instead spend money and buy a basket of public goods, how many jobs would that create? And then that result gives them more guidance. That's something I think that uh, officials would uh, serve their constituents by in um, considering these economic development deals. Look closely at the consultant you hire and make sure they include all the costs. Yeah, and, and look at the consultant's past record of making predictions and, and how much uh, uh, how, how accurate they were. Uh, one of the questions we've gotten from a viewer, Michael, is was there any uh, historical event that uh, caused uh, cities to uh, compete uh, uh, for economic development? Maybe it was, uh, I, I guess it came after the post-war, but uh, was there something that that drove this that caught their imagination? Even was there a city that was successful with it? You talked about Mississippi, but what what got all this rolling? Well, it was clearly the Great Depression. Uh, this particular uh, mayor and then governor, his last name was White, I forget his first name, uh, was desperate to lure northern manufacturing south. And he wanted to do that with subsidies. And it sort of sent up a red flag to other cities and states that, hey, we're losing jobs to competing governments because they're willing to subsidize this production. So that was the big event that was, that was tied to historically. I think uh, the major expansion that has taken place has just been a, a function of, well, if they're doing it, we have to do it. And they end up competing over job announcements rather than real jobs. I have long thought that uh, we should require governors and maybe mayors to attend a, uh, a warehouse closing for every ribbon cutting they go to. We, we only seem to see the good news. We never seem the bad. And, and I wonder if, uh, if we forced our leaders to go to business closings, they'd be less inclined to go to business openings. Or just uh, issue a press release announcing it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Haywood, is there anything that uh, a precipitous event that kind of started our convention center uh, uh, folly? Well, we, I, I mentioned the opening of, of McCormick Place, but the, the thing that has really reshaped the convention center business has been this ability to issue revenue bonds, uh, the ability to take on long-term debt based on visitor-oriented taxes, where in particular, the public doesn't have to vote on a general obligation bond issue. If you can cut out the need for a public review and approval uh, of, of uh, an enormous city debt, it, it thoroughly changes the political environment. Uh, and so we, we have a situation, for example, where uh, 
recently, St. Louis issued uh, $500 million in bonds to expand their America Center Convention Center. And the public didn't have any direct say in that. Uh, they could argue it was going to be paid for with hotel and restaurant taxes. Uh, and a precisely similar thing at the end of 2020 in Milwaukee with an expansion of their convention center, the Wisconsin Center. Um, it, it's a dynamic in which if the voters don't have to weigh in, then basically all bets are off. <laughs> and it's all too easy to spend money, even right now. Even uh, no, I don't doubt that. Gentlemen, I am uh, so grateful that you joined us today, uh, taking an hour out of your St. Patrick's Day to uh, to speak with us at the Dole Institute. Thank you very much uh, to our audience. Let me invite you to join us next week, March 24, when we discuss effective housing policy with KU's own Kirk McClure and Emily Hamilton of the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Thank you again for your time. I look forward to seeing you next week.